Okay, let's start off. Why even restore your windows? Um, there's a lot of reasons I've found to restore your windows. One is just authenticity. They're the original architectural pieces of your home. Uh, another good reason is that it be, can, can be done qualitatively. Architectural features of a house and were built extremely well originally. They might have been benignly neglected and looking a little worse for wear, but that's not a, an excuse not to fix them up. And uh, another reason, they're repairable. They are repairable. Sometimes we get some calls and people think, hey, this is just too bad. It's in too poor shape. I don't think you can repair it. We got to go and get a new one, but we argue we can. Um, another good reason to restore your window is possible resale. Maybe you're, you're thinking of moving on and changing homes. Most people that buy in a historic neighborhood want to want to live in a historic neighborhood and they want the original authentic pieces of that home. Things like the windows, the doors, the floors, etc. <laughs> Not the replacements. Um, energy efficiency is another reason I would argue for it. And I know there's a, a big bad window replacement industry out there that says no, but I'll explain that later. We can make them energy efficient so that you're comfortable and enjoy them and put that, that um, worry to rest. Another reason is lead safety. Most of you probably know or have heard that these old pieces are full of lead paint and that is typical, but we can deal with that issue and deal with it safely for us and for you. Um, sustainability sake, uh, for spending less on, on recreating <laughs> your old windows. Why not restore instead of reproduce it or have a new one made? That takes a lot of energy, a lot of money, a lot of time. And then lastly, I have return on investment. We find what through our research and just personal experience that there's a high return on investment when you restore versus when you replace what I've read, it's typically a negative return on investment. Okay, so there's a, a replacement mythology I'd like to attack. <laughs> and I bet you folks were ready for that since we're talking old windows. Um, and some myths to debunk. So one of which is vinyl is final. I um, hear this quite a bit. People seem to think you can have a maintenance-free home. And I was, I've been a carpenter, general contractor for decades, and now I'm an old window and entrance door specialist. It's exclusively focused on those things. But um, I find it kind of laughable when I see at the Home Depots and the Lowe's these maintenance-free products because as most of you probably have experienced yourselves if you worked on your home nothing is really final and things take maintenance and maybe that's fair especially if we love them we need to take care of them old windows equal astronomical heat bills well they can but not necessarily they can also equal ener energy efficiency to what the modern marketplace is selling but we hear a lot, especially from those window sales folks, that old windows are terrible. Replacement window, re replacements resemble historic windows. Well, I argue against that. That's a myth. Replacements are just what they are. They're replacements. They, they don't look true to the nature of your old historic windows, true to the nature of divided lights and the way your windows were made. If they really did, that we call them reproductions. A reproduction is an accurate reproduction. Um, replacements are greener. I would argue against it. It's a lot of energy. It's a, a larger ecological footprint to manufacture a new window versus restoring one. Um, it's cheaper to replace. Well, that's possible, but it might not be better. Um, lead painted windows should be removed. Well. The lead might need to be removed, but we don't have to give up on our architecture. So that's the argument we're making. So there are some of the myths. Moving on, let's get into the work. But before I do that, I think I'll talk about a window just in general here, because we often find my colleagues and I, it's when we discuss windows, sometimes uh, lay persons don't quite get what we're talking about. Um, this is a double hung window. It's got an upper sash and a lower sash, and they move up and down like a guillotine. Other windows open 
out or open inward like casements or awnings can open out or open in. This is a sample historic. It actually has been, uh, it is a historical window that I set up as a demonstration. But this is a double hung with its upper sash and its lower sash. And those will go up and down. This is a six light sash. The sashes are the moving parts. Sashes are the moving parts of a window. And this is a frame, what carpenters all often call a jam. Not like marmalade, but J-A-M-B, jam. <laughs> a jam with its moving parts, the sashes. Welcome, come on in, hi. It's okay, come on in, welcome. So this we call, in our shop, we, oh, that's a six over six. And what we're talking about, this is six lights of glass over six lights of glass. That's a double hung, six over six. Um, these are grills, they're sometimes called muntins. This is a jam inside here. This is casing. We're looking at the inside of the window with casing around the window. Um, and then in here we have the jam as I discussed. It's a little hard for you to see, but I'm sure you'll, you'll visit with it later, <laughs> I hope. And in between these we have some pieces. There's some trim pieces. Um, besides the casing, we have some stops. And these stops are trim pieces of wood that hold the window in place to keep those sashes, the moving parts, from flopping in and out. There are three stops associated with a double hung window. On the interior side we have a sash stop that's this little trim piece. That holds the lower sash in place from flopping in and out. So it can just go up and down. Um, then we have parting stops. These you'll, you'll see they're naturally um, finished here and I'll explain that later. Parting stop divides the two, it parts the two sashes. And then lastly, on the outside of the window, outside the house, we have a blind stop. And the blind stop is a support for this upper sash. Out here is a blind stop that supports the upper sash and also serves to support a storm window if you choose to put a storm window to protect your old one. Okay, so those are some window parts. Um, so moving on, let's talk about the process. So this is our process that we've been doing for many years. And we start out with a day of disassembly, sometimes two, depending on how big the building is. But here we're working on a home in Alexandria, historic Alexandria, George Washington's neighborhood. And we're taking out old windows. These windows were from the 1890s, maybe 1880s. And we're going to disassemble the window to a certain degree. So we're going to take off some of these stops and take those moving parts, the sashes, out of the openings and bring those back to our shop to fix them and restore them. The frame, the jam, is going to stay where it is. It's fixed pretty solidly to, to the building envelope and we're going to leave it there. But we're going to deal with some issues of the frame. The issues of the frame can be lead paint can be some damaged, repaired parts. Um, and uh, we're going to address those issues to make sure that these moving parts are going to work beautifully and flow freely in that opening so they have enough tolerance. We talk about a tolerance for the windows because they have to move and so there can't be friction on them. That would be too physically different for you to use your window and enjoy it. But we also talk about tolerance to allow for weather stripping. Weather stripping is material that we use to make sure old windows and doors don't leak. Don't leak air and don't leak water. So weather stripping is a way we can slow down and stop the draftiness of these old pieces. Um, so we need tolerance for that. And we all need to remind ourselves that wood expands and contracts. It's not static it expands and contracts and so we need to also allow for some of that movement with the seasonalities and the moisture and the humidity. So here's disassembly. We're dealing with a lead paint issue. There's an EPA law called RRP and that's something that um, we're, a, we're a licensed company that's, that's registered with the EPA to do, do this kind of work, control lead dust specifically, and to clean up appropriately and to set up appropriately for lead control, lead dust control. Um, we're going to free up those sashes and 
take them back to the shop eventually. We're going to scrape and sand and oil that window jam to make sure these sashes work. And we're going to remove those, including their hardware and their accessories, to the shop so we can work on all those different pieces. And then finally, what are we going to do at the openings? Well, we're going to weatherize. We don't want to leave your homes naked <laughs> and open. We're going to weatherize the openings. So we often might use just six mil plastic, like polyethylene sheeting, which is not a security measure, but it's a way we can make the window opening air and water tight. But if it's in a neighborhood like Alexandria or Capitol Hill, Hill uh, especially on the first floor, we want our, our clients to be comfortable. So we might put in a piece of plywood, or if they want to spend more money, maybe we put in plexiglass or something else until we can get those things back to the shop, get them restored, and get them back and rehung. So that's the, the, the start of the process. Here's, here we are in the shop. Uh, this is my old shop in Tacoma Park, and you can see in the background an interesting piece of machinery. It's a steam box. And we use that steam box to help us get the paint off. We also can see a, 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 um, a workstation here that's, that's uh, a table with a grill on it. And that, that's what we call a downdraft table. It has a, um, an air machine in there that basically filters the air and pulls it down away from the top of the table. So the grate allows the material to drop down, which is going to be lead paint and maybe some, some um, sawdust and wood fibers, etc. We're pulling that material down into a contained table in which we have this air machine that also filters the air. It filters the air through a HEPA filter, but also a, a secondary and a tertiary filter. And then it spits it back out to give us clean air into the room. Regardless, as you can see, that's me. I'm working and I've got a respirator on. And that's very common for us to use an approved respirator. All of our staff get trained to use these appropriately. Um, and we just we use it as a precaution. Yes, we do have a downdraft table that's very nice, but we're working hard and we're working with power tools and we're working with scrapers, carbide scraper blades, hardened steel scraper blades, and there's dust flying. So we're going to take that precaution. We're going to wear protective clothing and we're going to get these things stripped of that lead paint. So we're steaming sashes. We mark, we, the glass gets marked. We love the old wavy glass. That's authentic to, to an old historic building. Glass, uh, uh, the process of glass making evolved quite significantly in the past couple hundred years. And the old stuff was hand blown and hand rolled. We call it cylindrical glass or just commonly wavy glass, bubbly wavy old glass. That's very authentic to your homes, too. The period in which they were built is when they use this process of hand blowing and rolling glass, molten silicate. Um, so we like to reuse that as much as we can because it's authentic. And we mark every piece when we take it out just for, for ease of putting them back in. So we, we know where they go back. It'll be easier instead of a jigsaw puzzle to put them back and guess. Um, we use that steam box to cook them in that this is a, basically a stainless steel box with a pump and water pumping into there to create steam. It runs at about 205 or 6 degrees. Hi, welcome. And that helps us break the paint bond so that we can remove the paint without struggling. Paint does stick and even if it is 100 years old or eight coats of paint, we need to get through it because we're going to take all of it off. Typically when we do our full restoration process, we're going for the full Monty. We're taking it all down to the original wood. And there's not going to be a lead issue anymore, and we don't want one. So we're going to take all that off. We're going to take all the glazing off, remove the glass. The glazing is, when I refer to that, is the putty, the compound, the material we use, our ancestors used to bind glass to wood. Glazing putty, or glazing compound, or glazing, is the material we use to bind glass to wood. So there's, this is a wooden, these are wooden sashes in a wooden frame, but we have our pieces of glass that are bound into the sash, which is very important. We want that glass area not to leak air and water too. So when you talk about windows, whether new or old, you want to make sure that glass is nice and tight and gasketed so it doesn't leak. In general, windows are not high-performing building products. They're horrible. 
they're not very good at all, whether they're new or old. They're not very good compared to the, the, uh, the other products we can use nowadays in our buildings to get high energy efficiency, like spray foams and <laughs> fiberglass and cellulose, things of that nature. But lo and behold, we can't see through that stuff. Um, this we can see through, and I think that's a key reason why we love old windows and doors, because they're full of glass and light. And there's a biological connection, I would argue, for humans to connect to light and nature, et cetera. So um, onward, onward and onward. OK. So that's in, that's in our lead room. We have a dedicated lead room. The picture I showed before, just to clarify, where uh, we're all trained to go in there with appropriate clothing and it's a sealed room. It has a negative air condition, so we're not moving air through the, the, the room. We're keeping it contained, so we also contain that lead dust. Okay. Now we're moving on to um, stabilization and repairs. We've done stripping in there, and uh, we've stripped all the paint off. All the paint is coming off these flat surfaces, but also those OG profiles, the, the detailed, detailed um, architectural profiles. And now we're moving on to stabilization repairs. And stabilization involves making sure these windows are going to be stable so they can move up and down. And we're hoping maybe 60, 80, 100 years they'll be in great shape and can open and close readily and not rack out a square. So what we're going to do, and we've noticed, although these were made beautifully by master carpenters and folks that were certainly better, better than I am. And <laughs> did it a lot by hand. Um, with, regardless, the, um, there's a tendency for the sashes to become unstable over time. And that joinery, although it's the best joint, the strongest joint that we carpenters know, can loosen up. And we're talking about decades. But we want to make sure that doesn't happen and it, it's not readily likely to happen. So what we do is we call, we stabilize the joint. And we're basically putting a wooden dowel, an old growth wood or, or a hardwood dowel through the joinery, the mortise and tenon joint where these two pieces of wood meet. We're putting a dowel in there with a two-part slow cure epoxy. Before we set all that up, we square them up. We take braces, wooden pieces, and we temporarily brace them when we find square. And then we take the dowel and drill a hole and put, put a, a dowel through the, the lateral joint. So you give it some strength over the, the lateral cross section of the wood. Um, rotted wood is going to get repaired. And um, we teach all our, our, our new staff and even seasoned carpenters that come into our shops. We teach them we are going to save every bit of wood we can. But if it's rotted and the condition is compromised, let's get rid of it. But it doesn't mean we throw out the whole part. We do a strategic cut and splice in a new joint. So what we use for material is we use old, old growth wood. So yes, I guess I am the Lorax, Lorax and I'm here to speak for the trees <laughs> because there's not enough people speaking for the trees. And there is something called old growth wood and that's what our homes, our buildings, our ships, our bridges, our boats, et cetera, et cetera, were made of in, in in historic America. They were made from trees that were cut down after 80, 100, 150 years that grew very slowly over time and have a dense, dense growth ring to them. Those are called old growth wooden trees. And then after 150 years of growing in the forest, somebody made some beautiful pieces for your home and put them in like a window and a door. And there they sat for another 100 years. So it's no accident that that stuff is still around and it's still hanging in, even if it does look pretty sad. It was made old. It is made of old growth wood, and that to me is a treasure as a carpenter and as a window, old window restoration guy. So we're going to use the same thing. I don't go to Home Depot or the lumber modern lumber yards to buy modern plantation growth wood because it's junk. It's not very good. It's poor quality. It doesn't last. It might last 10 years, but I'm not talking 10 years. I'm talking 60, 80, 100, or 200 like these things last. 
let's use that. And how do I get it? Well, I salvage old windows. I go into the, to the dumpster, I admit it, <laughs> I'm guilty. Um, I do salvage old windows. Sometimes people offer to give them to me. Sometimes I offer to give them some, um, some money and a few bucks for your window, old windows that you're throwing out in the dump because they're made of old growth wood and I want it. And yes, it's work and it's energy, but it's mostly just my physical energy of having to scrape them down, sand them down, clean them up, wash them off, and bring them out of my lead room. And now I have wooden parts to use that are old growth wood. And it means I don't have to replicate what I need. If I had damage to this, if I have damage to this old window and I need to replicate a part, I don't need to mill it if I have like parts of that in old growth wood on my storage shelves in the shop. And that's what I'm searching for when I'm taking these old windows out of the landfill. So we use old growth wood and our process here is according to National Park Service standards. We work on National Park Service duly designated historic structures and the process that we follow uh, is is acceptable to National Park Service and that allows us to also use epoxy. Epoxy is like a glue. I'm sure most of you have heard of epoxies. They're very strong. They're very good. And we use an epoxy and old growth wood to do our repairs. Okay? Uh, sorry, one other thing. No metal fasteners. It's not an absolute, but I train my guys to avoid metal fat. Carpenters love nails and screws. It holds stuff together. It's helpful. It works. But we're restoration people, and we know from working on old pieces, we usually curse a little bit if we take our saw into an old piece of wood and we ruin the blade. There goes another $10, $15 blade. We, I teach my fellows, when you do your repairs, let's not use fasteners. Let's avoid it as much as possible. Let's try to use epoxies and glues and lots of clamps. I mean, it gets kind of crazy. One sash with 30 clamps on it, but it happens, right? So that's some of our work. Um, next, um, sanding. We got lots of sanding to do. After we do stabilization, we're going to sand these down. And we do use power sanders occasionally, but not entirely. The power sander, if it's a painted piece, it's going to get painted and primed. No big deal, but you, we need to be careful. We'll use the, the power sanders on the flat surfaces. But here on this, this OG profile, the architectural detail, you can see it's very delicate. It's just like a little couple ribs of wood. You don't want to take a power sander to that. You're going to have to hand sand that. So we do a lot of hand sanding. We go into the, to the details of all the wood and hand scrape and later come back and hand sand all those areas. Okay? Uh, power sanding and hand sanding. When we get to uh, through a 60 grit sanding process for both those profiled surfaces and flat surfaces, we found there's no evidence of pain anymore, no evidence of glazing. They're, they're cleaned up well. We're going to vacuum them off of dust just in case while we're in this lead room. And then we're going to wash them with TSP. TSP is, a, is a trisodium phosphate. That's a well-known product. You can pick it up at the hardware store, at the paint store. Many painters love to use it to prep their work before they paint to make sure the surfaces are clean so that the paint will, will bond better. We use it that's well known to bind to lead. If there's residual lead dust on something and we washed it down with the solution of TSP, that would help. Okay? Then we feel good about taking those out of there and we don't have to wear a respirator, which is a, a load on your body to work breathing through a filter all the time. So that's the, the lead room where we get a lot of that, that preliminary work done. Now we're on to, to uh, other processes and we're talking about the weather stripping and we're going to prepare these wooden pieces for weather stripping. And I hope you recall that weather stripping is the material we use around the perimeter of the window and at the mid rails. This is double hung so there's a mid rail section and around the perimeter, that space of the moving sashes, we're going to use metal stripping, and, sorry, metal weather stripping. We use the metal type. There are other types of, of weather stripping, but we like using the metal. It's historic. It's considered historic. America's original windows were not weather stripped in the colonial period and afterwards in the 1800s, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, they were just wood to wood windows. And 
People noticed they drafted, because they do, but they had to open and close them. Along around the 1930s, some crafty metal companies came up with a system to weather strip, to add this material to the perimeter and at the mid rails to add weather stripping. So you might see it. There's some bronze material here, and I'll pass some around. This is an example. This is zinc. Some of the original material was zinc. They also used some bronze, some spring bronze. We use the hard zinc and hard bronze. Um, and this is typical metal weather stripping. And the, the notion of it is that we've got a hard rib here, a hard, hard, this flange is a little bit soft, but this is the, the interactive section where we've let in a dado, a little groove around the perimeter, these six sides of the sashes, the upper and the lower. We let in a little groove so we can fit this in. So it acts as a physical break when the wind is trying to get in or get out of your house because that, that action is happening both ways. It has to roll around this rib of metal. Okay? And at the mid-rail section, it's kind of a, it's a, ne a neat little crafty invention where they set up a system. Because these can leak Here at the mid-rail, you have two pieces of wood, and wood isn't always perfect. It's not always straight, and sometimes it wasn't milled perfectly straight, or sometimes it just wants to go back to its old tree self. Um, at the mid-rail section, because it can leak there, with a little variability and imperfect meeting, we use a metal system there that interlocks. So the two metals meet and interlock in the upper sash. Here we let in this U-channel. That's a U-channel. And then on the lower sash, where you can't see it now, but on this back side, we let in a blade. And it looks a little, it's hard to see now, but I, I encourage you to come check out the material afterwards. But it's got a curved, a curved flange of metal. It's like an airplane wing, a very gentle curve like a wing. This blade actually will seat into the U-channel and meet. And if we did a really good job, it meets perfectly. And it's literally metal to metal. And if we look down there and we can't see light, it means you're not going to have air leaking there. Then any window has to have a sash lock because we want to make sure we're safe at night. But it also helps us to use that sash lock to set the lock and snug the metals up and squeeze. So that's how they made them airtight at the mid-rail area. So that's metal weather stripping. And we still use it. They're, they're modern types of weather stripping. And those are things you'll see on a modern window and a modern door. And they work too. Um, they don't last 100 years. Uh, this is hard metal. It will oxidize. It, it will last 100 years. I've taken out tons of 100-year-old metal, um, almost 100, 90. Uh, but anyway, the modern materials can be silicone tubes. They can be vinyl sweeps. Uh, they can be nylon bristles urethane foams with coatings, that kind of stuff. They do work. They can stop the draft of air, uh, but they will deteriorate. They will abrade and, and break down. But commonly, you can get 10, 15, 20 years of use out of a modern weather strip system. So that's weather stripping. And the picture shows myself working on a mid rail where we're modifying the mid rails. This is an old one, and we modify them so that we can set up this interlocking metal system. And as you can see, I'm using a hand plane, which is nice. We do have power tools in our shop. They do uh, work quickly, the power tool. But we do a lot of hand work. I would have to argue we're more artisanal than not. Um, and it's enjoyable for us, even if it might be slightly slower to use a plane. If you're a carpenter and you shave, it's a real nice feeling. OK. Uh, next, <coughs> priming and glazing. So uh, we've done the modification of the wooden sashes, those moving parts of the window. And now we put on some primers. We like oil-based primers. They work well. And we like to use two coats, not one. A lot of painters are in such a rush, they barely will prime anything nowadays. But we like to use two coats. We use one as a sealer coat, the idea of just sealing up the wood pores. And then the, we'll let that tack and dry sufficiently, and then we'll sand. Because it's really good to sand in between your coats of primer and paint so you get good bonding. 
And then the second coat will be a bonding coat. And then we'll move on later to two more coats of finish paint. Um, but after we do our, our priming, we're ready to do glass. Before we do any glazing or setting our glass in sashes, we check in with our clients because we've got their old glass and we took it out. Sometimes that old glass was broken and somebody dutifully, a painter or homeowner, dutifully covered up the crack in the corner. Sometimes it was undercut. It was old cylindrical wavy glass, highly variable glass. It wasn't sheet glass, modern industrialized glass. It comes out at a standard homogeneous thickness. It, um, it was highly variable and highly fragile. So if you had a big piece, that showed a lot of your wealth and, and, and ability to, to pay a glazer to, to make that glass and cut it. But we're going to reuse as much original glass as we can, and we're, we might need to cut it down. But um, we send our clients an in inventory of their glass, your home's <laughs> windows. What kind of glass do they have? If they're 120-year-old windows or 60-year-old windows, maybe some of the glass was accidentally broken over time. And back in the 50s or the 1960s or 80s or whatever, somebody replaced a piece of that glass. One of the panes got broken. and. Johnny or Emily threw the baseball through it, practicing out in the yard, we, it got replaced. And you might have a mixture of glass in your old home. You might have old historic hand-blown glass, but you might also have that mixed in with modern sheet glass. Modern sheet glass is in, is, has an industrialized process, as I mentioned, and it's standard, a standard thickness. And it doesn't have waviness to it or a bubble effect that was um, part of the process of making uh, cylindrical glass in the old days. So it looks quite different. And for folks like us, we're professional glazers. We're master window mechanics, professional glazers, and expert painters. But as part of that triumphant, um, we're upset as glazers, professional glazers, to see mixed glass in a window. We like uniformity. <laughs> we like them to look the same. But we leave that up to you. It's your house. Um, at any rate, we're going to put that glass back in with permission. Or if we need to replace it, let's, it's, now this is an opportune time. We took it out. <laughs> now this is an opportune to replace it if we need to. Really important about the glazing, we talk about energy efficiency of windows. They're horribly inefficient, new or old. But it's really important we get that glass right. And it has to do with your glazing. And we talk about back bending glass. Whenever you set glass, it's really important that you set it into the, to the glazing rabbit. And, and before you do that, you put glazing putty. So this is a grill. This is old growth wood from a oh, probably 100 year old window that's been cleaned up and it was one of these grills. And you can see there's a very narrow area. We call this the rabbit. It's a shoulder that holds the glass. And what I'm talking about is putting in a small amount of glazing putty here first before you put your glass. We set our glass in and we squeeze out some of that to make a good seal. We're trying to make a seal. We're making a gasket, just like your car engine and the, the motor head has a gasket so the oil doesn't leak. Just like your car has doors and windows and pieces of glass with those black rubber strips on each side, we want our glass not to leak like that. So we're going to first, we're going to use that glazing putty to do that. We're going to first back bed our glass. Then we're going to set our glass. We use little pins to hold it. And then we do this exterior face, which is a good thick amount, relatively speaking, compared to the back bed. But that gives us a gasket on the glass piece. So that's really crucial. So back bending, glass setting, and finally exterior face. And we like to pride ourselves on being good glazers. We like to keep the sight line of your window. So when you look through at this grill, and we're looking through the grill from the inside, you don't see glazing out in this area. If you're s smart and neat and clean and a good professional glazer, you glaze that just right to have this amount of glazing up to the, to the top of the rabbit. So we like to keep the sight lines, which means we're maximizing all the glass that you have in your window. So you have a really, really nice view. So that's glazing. Um, next. Uh, now we're on to painting and finishing. So we're going to put two coats of finished paint. After that, glazing has to cure. I, I, I sometimes forget to mention that. It's really important. I see guys work around town, and they're fixing a piece of glass, and handyman or whomever, but they're rushing, and they're, <laughs> they're not back bending their glass. They're, set, they're just taking out the old piece, putting a new one, and pinning it without a back bed, 
glazing really fast and running for lunch or a cigarette and then going and painting it. You can't do that. <laughs> glazing putties and the, the manufacturers of glazing compounds will warranty their product, but it has to be used in the right conditions and they tell you that and it'll say right on the can, um, seven, 10, 14 days for that glazing putty to set up properly. If it's an oil-based glazing, you can imagine what's going on. It's curing over time. It's releasing some oil. And if you think about that concept, if you went ahead and rushed your paint job and painted over your glazing area, and the, the, the glazing expressed oil underneath, what does it do but push the paint off of the, the surface? So we don't want to do that. It means your paint will fail. So we've got to wait. So we're using, this is a process. This is taking weeks, not days. Our process that we call a full restoration takes eight weeks to 10 weeks. So we've got epoxies that are slow cure. They don't cure in five seconds. They don't cure in five minutes. They might cure in a day or two days or four or five days, depending on how much epoxy. We've got glazing compounds that are oil-based, and they can take three, five, seven days to cure. We've got oil-based paints that, depending on manufacturer, can take two days or can take a day. So it's a process, it takes a bit of time. Don't want to rush it, why bother? Why not do a good job instead of a poor one? <laughs> now, anyway, so um, moving on, we're gonna do two coats of finished paint. We're gonna install our mid-rail weather strip at the shop because we can. So that's the material here. This other stuff around the perimeter we're gonna put in at the house and we're coming back to restore. These sashes are coming back looking beautiful and ready to go back in and we'll put that perimeter material in at that time. Because we can in the shop, we'll put in the mid-rail weather strip. We'll weigh and mark the sashes. And that's really important because these have a balance system. And the balance system is called pulleys and weights. There are weights over in this pocket. And there are pulleys. And there's a cotton cord. And this can go up with one or two fingers because it has its own system. I don't need my bicep to raise and lower that because it has a balance system. America's colonial w windows and prior to pretty much the Civil War, 1860s, had no balance system. It was grandma's stick, or <laughs> that's about it. So you used your bicep and hook, brought it up and took a hook and hooked up the sash to get some fresh air, or grabbed the stick and shoved it in there and held it open and got some fresh air. Nowadays, we have windows with balance system. It's a comfort, it's, enjoy, it's a joy to use. And this one, I think, is probably the best they ever made, better than these modern, fancy, sexy windows that have these spring-loaded tapes and such that often break, and I get calls from these folks that ask me to fix them, and I explain to them we only work on old windows. Anything 60 years or older is what we like, so we don't go near the, the dark side and the evil replacement windows. <laughs> they're actually built to be replaced. That's why they're called replacement. And you try to get them repaired, and they'll tell you, Eventually, they might be kind of gentle at first, but they'll tell you, oh, I'm sorry, you need to buy a new one. So it's sort of planned obsolescence. But um, it's a wonderful system and it works with gravity and some lead weights or steel weights. And they balance, can be balanced beautifully. But we want to check. We just spent all this time and effort working and redoing these. Hopefully, it's to last another 80 years before they can get restored again. Let's double check the weight of that. When we worked at the house, or the residents, we took them out of there and we take production notes. We like taking notes. And we take production notes and when we size these windows to their opening, that relationship of moving part to fixed frame, we made notations about that. We also made notations about what the hardware and the glass was like and what other issues we found, whatever we discovered in our process of disassembly, including what weights are in the pockets. Occasionally, there are some missing. For some reason, somebody threw them away or whatever. But we take notes about that to check. After doing this process for eight weeks, we want to make sure maybe we had to replace some of the glass. Maybe it made sense to use some regular glass instead of antique in this window for, for whatever reason. Perhaps it's going to be a little bit heavier. Or maybe it's a little bit lighter. I don't know. We stripped it all down. Let's make sure it's balanced. It's not a perfect science. It doesn't have to be super exact, but we want to make it close enough so they balance themselves. So you can 
Put this window wherever you want it. How much fresh air do you want tonight? Just a little honey or a lot? <laughs> Both of these should go up and down with one or two fingers. And they're balanced on their own wherever you like them. So that's the weight system. We're also going to restore all your hardware. The hardware gets painted up. Painters love to coat stuff, but unfortunately that doesn't work well. If, um, you know, the pulleys have wheels. That's an old pulley that's been cleaned up. It's got a little broken flange, but that's a nice clean one. We usually find them, they're all painted up. And we find the sash locks are all painted up. And that to us is also a tragedy. Um, if you and I went out and painted our car wheels, we'd all laugh at each other. <laughs> Um, the sash lock, this has a wheel that has to roll. The sash locks have springs in them that have to flex. So we leave that stuff unpainted and we just oil it up. And it often comes out gorgeous because it's cast metal. The folks that made your windows in old historic times put beautiful material in there. It wasn't just old growth wood and hand blown cylindrical glass, but they put in cast metals or forged metals that last 100 years too instead of the pressed metal junk like Home Depot for $2.99. So why not restore this, get it functioning if we can, and put it back in and reuse. So we're master recyclists. Um, now we're also going to prepare new parting stop. And these are some of those trim details I told you about when we talked about what is a window and what are its parts. And the interior side, the first stop we come to is a sash stop. It's the guide for the lower sash to go up and down and not flop in and out. Well, these often are heavily painted. We don't restore these typically. We reuse them. And we just take the paint bead off the back side where my finger is now. There's often a thickening of paint. We call it paint bead. It's impossible for any human that I know to paint a perfect line of paint on something. It's natural for your hand to roll and the brush to roll a little bit, the bristles of the brush. That's normal. The paint itself has capillary action and it adheres to itself. It has adhesion property and the paint will stick and curl. So you'll find a thickening. We call it a bead, a paint bead. You'll find a thickening on painted parts and you'll find a lot of thickening on these windows, because in America they're traditionally painted all the time, and if they look a little sad, they get repainted. But instead of that, we take that paint bead off the back side of this and we just use oil there and, and leave it. Oil for us is linseed oil. Linseed oil is tried and true carpenter material. It's used, been used for centuries, I don't know how long even, but it's been used a long time and it seals the wood pore. That's what we're looking to get to. And you can use paints and primers, or you can use oils to seal up wood pores. You'll notice if you take a look at this window, and I encourage you to, to check it out. I, I like it. <laughs> um, it's got a natural jam on select parts. Part of the, the jam, the frame, is covered with weather strip because we don't want them to leak. But other parts of it are exposed. And if you look at the window in the closed position, you can see there's some natural looking pieces of wood and those are just clean pieces of dug fir vertical grain old growth wood that we just sanded and used oil instead of the paint. And that's one of the things we've discovered works really well to make sure the windows will always work. If we go back to the paint system, it's normal, the windows look a little sad, they get repainted. If you start applying that to the jam, Every five, six, ten years, pretty soon you've got an eighth of an inch of material and we don't have the tolerance for them to move up and down, for you to enjoy them with one or two fingers, for them to expand and contract, for them to have their weather strip and not be, be frictionized, if that's a word. Um, so we're going to oil the edges instead of paint the edges. And if we put a paint bead on them, which we do because it's normal, we take that off the edge, the concealed edge. I'm not talking about exposed edges. I'm talking about concealed edges. These six sides, we will take the paint bead off of those with a, a planer and a sander, very gently, just a little bit to get the bead off, the curled thickening, and then we'll sand it and put the oil there instead so it'll work with the metal system. The metal system, as I mentioned, is very little tolerance. It's metal to metal, very little tolerance with the sash and the metal. So if you have a paint bead and you get thickening after time especially, 
you're losing that tolerance and pretty soon the windows don't close easily. There's friction to open and close them. The mid rails don't meet up well and pretty soon this system isn't working anymore. So we go to an oil system to make sure it works for a long, long time. And um, as I mentioned, we're going to refinish the old sash stops. And, oh, Daniel, I thought we had a piece of parting stop, but we don't. That's okay. I'm going to show people. So let's keep moving. Um, oh, here's a, my friend made a video. He does some beautiful work up in Maine. Thank you, Lisa. I need help with that. But um, We're going to try and show the video just to get to get a sense of, of doing window restoration and what it's like. Okay, we're almost there. Um, we're about ready to get back and rehang these sashes. So we get a date, and we're going to return and reinstall these beautifully restored pieces and their accessories. What does that entail? Well, the, the pulley system on these old windows on this one is, is pulleys and weights with a cotton cord. And this is a real good cotton cord. We love it. It's called Samson Spot Cord Number 8. It is rated for 45 pound sash. That's a pretty big sash. That's, these probably weigh mm, about 10 pounds. So that cotton can take quite a bit. But you never paint it. We often find painters paint that too. But we're going to put new cord on for sure. And then we're going to bring back the, um, the restored hardware. And we just cleaned it up, got all the paint off of it. And we actually cook that up and have our own recipe in a crock pot and then we wire, have a wire wheel on a grinder and, and get all the, the evidence of, of paint off of there and then we go and oil them up. And then we usually leave them, leave them to our clients if they want to do something a little extra like lacquer or, or clear coat them, that's up to them. But we get them working really great and they look really beautiful and original. So we're going to bring back restored hardware. We're going to bring back our new parting stop that we made out of Doug fir. We matched our old parting stop. Whenever we're working these windows, we take that piece out when we're, we're disassembling them. And it's a sample piece for us, the old parting stop. What was it, what's the size that they made 100 years ago? We'll go and match that size and not paint it this time. Just sand it and oil it. And we'll bring that back with us. We're going to bring our weather strip for the perimeter. And we're going to bring them back refinished, not restored. They're refinished old sash stops. If they're in bad shape, we might have a conversation with the client about replacing them. But if they're in good shape, let's reuse them. They're old growth wood, too. They just had too much paint on them. So we took that paint bead off the back. Hi. Um, we're going we're gonna to take it. It took us about four hours, four or five hours to get the windows out when we did the disassembly process. We dealt with the lead paint issue. We abided by the EPA lead law to clean up appropriately, to set up appropriately, and to clean up appropriately and dispose of the material. Um, that took us about four hours to work a window open. One of our mechanics needs about four hours to get it out, deal with the jam issues, set up for EPA lead law, and clean up appropriately so that we don't leave the residence with any lead residue. Now we're coming back after eight weeks of this process, it's going to take us again about four or five hours to put this back together. We've got restored sashes. 
We've got new weather strip. It might be in bronze or zinc. We've got new cotton cord like that. Or it maybe it's sash chain. Our clients say, oh, I love chain. How about that? It'll last forever. You're right. <laughs> Let's put some chain in instead if you want. Sometimes it's a little noisy, but some people love it. It's fine. We're going to bring back cord or chain. We're going to bring back party and stop. We're going to reuse your old sash tops, and we're bringing back the restored sashes. And we're going to spend four, four or five hours working them. And what are we doing? We're hanging them and putting that metal system in and their hardware and making sure it works right. We want these mid rails to line up flush so you can set your lock easily and you snug up your, your metal weather strip system. Uh, but guess what? We just worked for four hours. We might have had to check the weight pocket or, and replace a weight or two. Our hands got a little dirty, and we smudged up the glass and smudged up that professional paint job. Now we're going to touch up the glass one more time and then touch up the paint. Now we're finally done and ready to turn them over to the homeowners. So what is all this going to cost me? So yeah, full, our full process is intense, but what we found is slightly less than the very best high-end replacement windows. The difference, we argue, is that you get your money back. You're going to get a, a positive financial return. What we see from the replacements is a lot of failure. And it could be five-year failure or 10 or 20. There's, I don't think there are any companies that are given more than a 20-year warranty on a replacement window. But it's limited, and it, it's only 20 years. I'm talking about your old windows, old growth wood windows, lasting 60, 80, 100 years. And then guess what? You could repair them again or restore them again. So if there are issues, you're not stuck. You don't have to get a new replacement window every 5, 10, 15 years. No, you can repair. So um, full restoration is less than a reproduction. If we, we could do reproductions. We could reproduce the exact profiles of your window, the exact dimensions of your styles and your rails. We could do that. We, we could use the shape of router blades and make, make material have an exact match to your old home. But it costs more money. Um, and the lifespan, I just explained that. Replacements, uh, I've heard in, a couple years ago in Fine Home Building, I read an article where they think 30% of the replacement windows fail within 10 years. Um, lifespan of old growth windows could be 100, 200, who knows? And then your return on investment could be short or long depending on what you're choosing and what's repairable versus replacement, replacement, replacement. Okay? Um, Next, storm windows. I do have to talk about storm windows because they're crucial. And most people don't know. And uh, the uh, replacement window companies don't want you to know this. But a good restored window with weather stripping, good glazing, non-leaky weight po po pockets, excuse me, non-leaky weight pockets, and a good storm window that's well installed is of equal performance to the best two-pane replacement window. Most people don't want you to know that if they're in the replacement window industry. It is a billion dollar business. And there's not much business in, in rest restoration. There's very few people out restoring. So there's a lot of America's architecture is already gone and it's too late. And we might have lost 50, 60 percent of the windows. That's millions and millions per year are just going straight to the landfill. So I say it's worth it. but. How can we get equal energy efficiency? We restore professionally, or you restore professionally. We do a good job. We think about these things, gasketing glass and weather stripping. We can't skip that part, even though it might be fussy. Um, we're going to do those things, and we're going to encourage all of our clients to invest in storm windows. That way, you can create your own two-pane system. The replacement window companies want you to buy a two-pane system, and that's what they do to denigrate your, your home's one pane windows, they come and say, oh, it's a beautiful home, but oh, the windows are so terrible. You should buy the two pane replacements that I'm selling you, and I'll give you 30% off today. <laughs> but all they're selling you is a two pane system, and it's usually just two pieces of glass. They either pull a vacuum on that, or they put an inert gas, usually argon, and a desiccant, and they seal it. And guess what? They often fail, and they don't last forever. Oh my gosh, really? Yes, replacements don't last forever. So I get a lot of calls from people, and they say, my, my windows are all milky. They're all foggy. And I say, how old are they? And they say, oh, they're 15 years old. And I say, oh, well, the gasket's gone on your IGU, your insulated glass unit. That's a fancy word for a modern 
two-pane window system, an IGU, an insulated glass unit. Insulated is a relative term, as I mentioned before. This is not super insulated like R50. This is R2 or 3. Okay, so you can create R2 yourself if you have a good, good, good conditioned old window and you put a good storm window in there. That's going to give you two panes, maybe in a deeper setting, but it'll create the same thing. And they've done a lot of tests. You don't have to believe me. Please do your own research. There are plenty of, of uh, uh, trusted research institutions like B Berkeley National Labs or Chicago University or Department of Energy, et cetera, et cetera, that have tested these window systems and found them to be of equal performance. And it's relative. Sometimes they're slightly less. Sometimes they're slightly better. But it's usually around 5%, something like that. So in this manner, we say you can have your cake and eat it too. You can have your old growth wooden window that's beautiful and authentic to your home and have energy efficiency at the same time and they'll last 100 years and not 10. So we think that's the better investment. But the storm window is a crucial piece. You get to protect your investment. You get to achieve that energy efficiency. You get to, you can, the, the good news is that they have historically sensitive storm windows. So we make a distinction in about storm windows. Uh, I talk about my parents' generation of storm windows and those are the kind of clunky triple tracks that we see a lot that came about in the 1940s and the 50s and the 60s and the tin man types came around the neighborhoods and started selling and hanging storms on it. People had leaky windows and they said well oh the guy says this is the right thing to do let's let's get them honey let's put in these storms but they're pretty pretty um, clunky looking they often stick out past your architecture so they often will stick out past your casings of your home and so the first thing your eye usually cobbles onto is that, that old clunky storm window, as opposed to looking through something that's set in. The historically sensitive ones is a term to be used where they're very di diminutive. Um, they're mostly all glass. They're not invisible, but almost. You have a tendency to look through all that glass of the storm and look at your old, the old character of the window, the dimensions of, the, of its architecture the OG profile detail, that kind of thing. So that's historically sensitive. And what I've heard from um, going to talks from the National Park Service and such and listening to some of the experts in the National Park Service, they tell me the return on investment is good. And there's some variables depending on what kind of glass you use. But typically what I've heard at these talks is usually they say within seven to 10 years, you can recoup your investment in a good quality storm. So that's storm windows. Um, that's about it. We're back to the beginning. So maybe we'll take a breath and open it up for some questions. That IGU fails. That gasket on the insulated glass unit fails, fails. Um, the, I get calls from people about their, their the spring-loaded tape balances. No, not tape, but they're spring-loaded. They're spring balances. Often it's not a tape, but it's a spring with a cord or um, whatever. I get calls from people with five-year-old new windows, and they want me to come out and fix them. I don't work on new, but I feel sorry for them because <coughs> they've probably gone back to the replacement company, and that, that balance mechanism that should last for decades has lasted five years. So we see those failing. Um, the, win the new windows are clad. And you know why they're clad? If they're, even if they're wooden windows, they clad them because the company, the industry, knows the material's inferior. It's not old growth wood. They didn't get a tree out of the woods that grew for 150 years and then milled it and made these beautiful, <laughs> gorgeous pieces. They use fast growth woods. Those get clad because they know they're not going to last. So cladding is a wrap. They're clad. They're wrapped in vinyl or they're wrapped in aluminum. And to me, they take away the wooden look of your home, but they also are, are you know, symbol, a symbol of the, the limited life of that piece. So that's going to fail eventually, too. The hardware fails. Um, you know, hardware, in my mind, like this cast metal stuff, we get pulleys out of Baltimore or Frederick, and they've been around for 150 years. Cast, beautiful forged metals, and then I get calls from people that have new hardware on new windows and it didn't last 10 years. It's built to be replaced. It's planned obsolete. 
And then you're stuck because you threw out your old architecture, went to the landfill, you can't get it back, it already went in, in there, and you got to buy the replacement every 10, 20 years. No, I mean, we kind of feel like we haven't found something we couldn't. There are instances where we've had to replace fairly significant amounts of that window, but we save whatever we can save. We're really really dedicated about that. We feel really strongly about the old growth wood. So if it's not showing any signs of, of deterioration, we're going to leave that part. The deteriorated part, we're going to cut it out and do the repair. And that can be a trick. That's hard. A lot of the guys that come in are not of carpentry background. In my shop, they might have been painters. They might just be interested in window restoration and want to, want to learn how do you do it. And, it can take some, some finer carpentry skills. Likewise with that weather strip system, that can be a little fussy, but it can be done. Well, I mean, you could do your own research. I can tell you what I know, but you can do your own research too. And a lot of the companies are going to tell you, oh, the replacement, this is what it costs. They'll tell you about the material costs and not about the labor. They'll tell you this or tell you that. In our experience, we find it's slightly less than the high-end replacement. We're talking about quality replacement windows. And I know I've been a bit uh, hard on the replacement window company, but th there are some fairly decent products out there, but they're not cheap. And we're not cheap either, because <coughs> you probably got a sense this is not a, a quick fix. This is a lot of work. So we take a, a, a six over six like this, we'll spend seven, eight hours in the field working that to get it out and put it back in when it's all restored. But then we'll go back to the shop and we'll spend 30 to 32 hours per window of labor time restoring that whole thing. But we're not doing three things. We're doing 30 or 50 or 60. I forget because I get tired of counting. Um, we're doing a lot. And it, it's typically slightly less than the best two end replacements, two pain replacements. Yeah, it, yeah. They, they're going to break. We, we, we break glass, and we're glazers, professional glazers, and we know glass really well. We study it every day almost. Uh, we break some ourselves. It's a fragile material. It's inevitable. Uh, you, just get, you do your best to be careful, and sometimes you break it, and you've got to walk away and take a, take a walk or a breath, deep breath, and other times you're lucky and you don't. So... In our shop, we salvage uh, old windows, as I mentioned, but we um, also salvage them for their glass. And if we're lucky, we go and harvest the glass out, and we don't break a lot of it, and then we can cut it down for pieces that are smaller in size. And so we have in our shop a couple kinds of glass that we used to have on hand for our clients because we have issues with glass. It's normal. And we have salvage antique from 1890s buildings or 1905 or... 1880 or whatever. We also have uh, modern sheet glass that we use. You know, a lot of people, if it's the back bathroom or the kids' attic playroom, don't worry about it. Let's put in regular DSB 1 8 inch sheet glass. Uh, we also use a product from Germany. It's called Restover that I'm fond of. Most of my guys are fond of. It's very pretty. It's an imitation reproduction glass. It's made industrially. It's, it's totally uniform 1 8 inch thick but it has built-in waves in it, and it looks quite nice. You need to be careful with that stuff because sometimes it can get real active. We talk about the activity of glass. It can be active, and as you see, the process got more and more sophisticated, although they were blowing and hand-rolling cylindrical silicate. They got better and better, so we see the glass is a bit more uh, refined, the, the way it was made, 1930s, etc., 1880s. It was a pretty soupy and wild, right? Um, but we see it getting a little more refined through time, um, but it's still very fragile. <laughs> so we have these other materials that we can use, and we, we have the salvage, and we have this German stuff. I've seen some glass, mostly in um, Alexandria, Bentheim, which is really active. It's like probably 1800s early, and it can be really a bit disorienting when you look at it. You know, uh, it's normal to have a little bit of waves, but often you don't catch it until it's it's hit with a certain light, maybe a backlight or something, or the sideways view. And yeah, that looks a little wavy. But um, some of the stuff is more aggressively wild or wavy than others.
Yeah, there are other systems that I just described my favorite. <laughs> but the, there are other systems. We're, we're doing a job in a, a historic um, Alexandria, George Washington's neighborhood right now, like Frederick, 1740s. Those homes were not built for pulleys and weights usually. So, um, you know, we have a conversation with our clients. We like to have function, and we're carpenters and glazers and painters. We like windows to function. They're double hung, but America, you know, initially built windows that had an upper and a lower sash, but they didn't function as double hungs. They functioned as single hung. They fixed the upper sash, like, like Miss is describing, and they had the lower sash operable. That's a single hung window. A double hung is when it functions both of them, upper and lower, can be moved where you like. If you don't have a, a balance system, you need one, or you got to use grandma's stick or the, uh, some kind of hook and, and catch system. Okay. But we're a job that, as an example, we're doing the Peterson job in Alexandria, and we're using a, a spring loaded tape balance. Um, these came about in America in the 1930s. A couple companies made them, like Pullman and Caldwell. Um, and they're pretty nice, they work well. And we can get our one or two finger test to work on them. And we can set it up if the client wishes to have both of them functioning so we can make a double hung or a single hung out of that window. So these ones that I'll mention that are called historically sensitive are uh, readily accepted by historic commissions. And that means they've gone through the National Park Service, and the Na National Park Service has blessed them for duly registered historic structures. You always do need to check in with the local folks to make sure, but they're readily approved. And maybe Lisa would want to talk about that or not, but um, you know, it, it, it could depend. You might have historically had wooden storms, right? But those could be made too. You could have a wooden storm and you could weather strip it. The thing about the storm, you just need to have a couple weep holes at the bottom. They always have weep holes, and that's because you, windows condensate, and you've got conduction and convection of air, different temperatures air, and you'll get condensate. You want that condensate let out of your window and to drain out the, down the sill. So the important thing for the storm window is to seal it, make a good hermetic seal on that storm, but there are two holes left at the very bottom for water to escape. Just that much is inefficient. That's about it. Yeah. The, the historically sensitive storm windows come with screens. That's sort of a given. It's odd for people to order a storm window without a screen, but uh, the way they can make a minimalist and a half inch thick is they can just put in glass panels in a frame that's the storm window. And then one of those panels, or sometimes both, are removable. It can be, um, you can store the panel in your basement or in your garage, and for the nice weather around here, April to October, you can have a screen in there for fresh air. Great question. That's a good question. That's hard. Yeah. <laughs> and most people don't, and it drives me nuts. I see carpenters that are beat them out of there, and it just breaks my heart. They're damaging all that lovely stuff. Yeah, when you want to take those out, we do all our work from the inside, by the way. It's comfortable. You can stand on the floor and don't have to get up on the ladder too much. Um, or to get up on a 30-foot ladder, it's just a small ladder, depending on how big the window is. But we do all our work from the inside. And here's an inside view of a window. You want to start here at the sash stop, that first stop that holds the lower sash in place, and cut that free. It, Cut it. Yeah, there's some caulk and paint with a utility knife. A utility. Yeah, okay. and, and if it's an old lead window, you want to wear your respirator. Okay. Yep. So cut through that to break that bond. And, and then you take a small pry bar and you want to pry this out because it's nailed in there. Some of the old, uh, old windows, they use screws and they used a, an insert. And that insert is a, a, had a slot in it. Usually it was bronze or brass. And you could adjust the sexy old windows. I've seen them in New England, not too many here, some in Baltimore. You could adjust the sash top for winter and spring. Crazy. I mean, we're talking about wood moves like a 32nd of an inch. But if you wanted to, they set these up so you could loosen the screws and move your sash tops just this much if you wanted. 
but yours are probably going to have nails. So take that pry bar in there and use your pry bar to loosen this up so you can pop that piece off. Then you're going to get access to these sashes, cut the cotton cord. Let's look at this one because it's If you've got weather strip around, you might have weather strip on your windows, you might not. But if you do, we usually just nail these side pieces of weather strip with two bronze nails. That makes it easier to go do work on it. If you ever need to replace a cord 40 years from now, let's replace the cord. I don't need to damage the weather strip either. I'm going to reuse that piece. I can take the stop off. I can free up the sash by cutting the cords. And then I can take that, the, a, piece of, um, a piece of the weather strip off and remove this sash, and then go back and record it, check the weights, whatever, OK? Yeah, there are a couple of ways that you do it. So the options are you can go to reproduction, which I mentioned before, which is more expensive. The other option is I go and others, my colleagues or neighbors or friends or whatever, we go to the salvage yards, the, the, the salvage yards that are around. I don't know if they have one in Frederick or not, but. In Baltimore, there are a number of them. We have one down around um, um, Tacoma Park in Edmonston, Maryland. It's an architectural salvage yard where people donate goods. It's 501, what is it? What's the designation? Yeah, nonprofit. So people donate goods that are extra. Contractors with extra goods come and donate things, and they get a tax credit. And then the, the nonprofit architectural salvage yard sells that to the general public. And they'll often have sashes in there. And what you want to do is look for one that's going to match your, your style windows at your home. And that, if it's close in size, we can modify fairly readily without too much drama and to get it to fit your opening. Or we got to go to the reproduction thing. The thing about the reproductions for me is, uh, as a carpenter, I always go to is what are we going to use for wood? What should we use? The architects are pushing a lot of these exotics, the mahoganies and sepili, sepili mahogany or hardurin or whatever, coba. I mean, that's not lovely stuff, but it's probably coming out of the rainforest and who knows. And I mean, we can do that, but something to consider. We, I've done a job in Silver Spring now just recently, and we're going back to finish the house. We did a, a test drive on two windows, and they had all vinyl replacements in the house. And the homeowner asked us, after we restored a couple of select pieces that were missed, the homeowner asked us, can we go fix the rest of the house? I'm for, from Historic Williamsburg. I want historical windows in my house here in Silver Spring. I said, well, reproduction are going to get costly. How about if we find something? Well, he went and found it. We checked with each other about the dimensions. And he drove up to York, Pennsylvania and double checked. And then he paid them. It was some, some salvage yard in York that had salvaged sash from an old dairy processing facility that had 60 windows. And he went and bought 40 sash and made sure with me, he checked with me that the dimensions were close and that the, the profile was close. And now we've gone and taken those out of his basement. After we took the vinyls, the, the demonstration windows, we took the vinyls out, went back to the old jams, dealt with issues there, and then restored these York, Pennsylvania sash to fit that opening. Now, it was more work. It was more money slightly than our full restoration because we had to modify the mortise and tenon joinery. We had to modify some of the, the, the dimension because it wasn't perfect. But it was less than reproduction. So that's an option. Yeah, so the tape balances I was describing before, which maybe you're referring to, um, there are a number, there's a spiral tube balance, which doesn't get, uh, have any component that gets inserted into the jam. It's a, a spiral tube that's spring-loaded spring and goes on the edge of the sash and not, not um, mortised into the jam. There are also the, the, um, the steel tape balances that I mentioned before earlier. Those need to be mortised. So we cut an opening into the jam and it includes into the, the, the stud, the frame. And it just depends. It just gets mortised in. And so it just depends. We make sure they're well balanced, so we want to match it. So we check with the, the retailer or the company that manufactured the manufacturer to say, OK, what size tape do I need? And that, that determines our mortise. Do you have a recommendation for that manufacturer? Uh, Pullman or Caldwell? 
Holman is up in New York, Caldwell, I'm not sure where they're, but they, I would do Google that on the internet. <laughs> Any other questions? All coats, all coats, in between every coat of paint or primer. You don't, you don't sand the glazing, the glazing doesn't get sanded. Bleach, a little bit of bleach. It's nice to, you know, that stuff sometimes, and it looked pretty easy in the video. God bless Mark for making it easy, like, look easy like that. But it's often hard. We know from experience from doing it for years and thousands of sashes, it can be hard to get the paint up even if you steamed it. Even if you use the infrared steam stripper, even if you use the garment wand or whatever, sometimes that paint is just stuck on there. And likewise with the glass. So you do these little things to help your, your day go a little better, a little easier. And sometimes the glazing putty and the paint are still fixed on there. Or they, people come in later and silicone the heck out of those glass pieces of glass. And uh, if you soak it, it'll help you a lot. Let it sit overnight. Let it sit a couple of days even. Get, you can set up tanks with a little bit of bleach in it and soak it. So you can make your own steam box. Um, they're, they're, it can be a simplistically made with plywood and, and foam board that you get up at the hardware store. Um, and you can look around for one of those um, garment steamers. I've, I've got one of those that I use to help me. I've made a little gizmo, uh, I don't know, uh, what do we call it, but it's a, my gizmo <laughs> that I use to soften the glazing. So when we're up in that lead room and we're taking the glass out, Sometimes, because we do have thermal breakage in that stainless steel steam box, if I put big pieces of glass in there, they often break. And it's historic and it's antique and gorgeous and wave and we love it. We'd rather not break it. So we'll often steam that glazing very, very carefully, very, very strategically, just heating up the glazing area on the other side and not the glass so it doesn't break and loosen it up. And the way we can do that is with a heat gun. They all have some fancy ones that are using infrared nowadays. We, they're called steam strippers and such. But they all, there are some modest ones you can get just at the hardware store locally that, that use heat. You need to be gentle with that and careful. You need to wear a respirator because you don't want to liberate lead and vaporize it because that will go into your blood. You need to protect yourself. But yes, you can protect yourself and be careful. Use a heat gun. Use infrared steam stripper. And you can use, set up a garment steamer and modify the attachment instead of steaming your clothes to iron them for work you can steam sash or you can make a homemade steam box take the garment stripper drill a hole into that box that you built with plywood and styrofoam made it nice and snug Just take the hose of that garment ste steamer and, and put it into the hole and let the steam fill up that cavity put the sash in there and warm it up You want to minimize your exposure. You're not going to, unless you ingest it, it's dangerous. That's the issue is ingestion. You don't want to breathe it, take it through your lungs, and you don't want to eat it. Those are the two ways you're going to get lead poisoning. So you need a proper, you need a proper respirator. Technically, you need to be cleared by a medical doctor. If you're working for me, all my guys are cleared to work in my, in my shop. They go to the doctor first. And the doctor checks to make sure they can handle wearing a respirator. If you have a heart condition, we don't want you to lose it at work, <laughs> right? So we get, get them cleared and we fit them properly so that you know how to wear it. If you wear, it might be the perfect respirator, but if you wear it improperly, you could poison yourself. So you need to be able to fit yourself. Um, and then proper hygiene, you have to wash after You've worked in a lead area, wash your hands, don't touch your mouth after you just worked with this stuff. We find the guys that uh, smoke cigarettes and chew their nails have trouble sometimes uh, working for me. They're ingesting it by accident and they're not careful. You need to be hygienic and careful. Yeah, sure. The doors, we, as we were talking about before at the start, the doors can be restored similarly to this process. Uh, one thing with the doors I always tell people is that they were, those were made, the mortise and tenon joints on those, they always glued. And that was really important to make sure they didn't sag. That helped a lot. 
And that horse glue or hide glue was real crucial for them to, to maintain their integrity and squareness and plumbness. Uh, but that does fail, and we find that on our doors we restore, we take them fully apart. All the mortars and tenon joinery comes all apart, and we redo it. And if it's bowed or, or cupped or whatever, we take that out. That's a bit of work. But it's the, the, the system we use up for the, the doors for weather stripping, uh, the ubiquitous system seen in America that, that was spread everywhere was a spring bronze, and you might have it at your home here. Um, I'm not very fond of it because I've noticed that the doors still leak a lot, and we want them to leak a little or none. Um, that system is designed to go to the edge of a door, and we find it better to, to interface with the face of the door where it intersects with the stop, so you can hit the face. If you try to fill in the edge, the edge is often variable of the door versus the jam, the frame. Wood isn't perfect. It moves a little bit. It's rarely dead straight or milled perfectly. So the spring bronze, what I find is the spring bronze doesn't always take up the space. It's supposed to be compressed and fill that gap on the edge. And I find it often is leaking and there's light coming through. You know it's leaking. So we use a different system on the doors. It's also made by this company from the 1890s, the Accurate Metal Weather Strip Company. And it's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a hard metal like, like these. We use the bronze because a front door is a, a piece of elegance and a statement of your entire home. We use this, um, this metal system that has a hard rib and the metal's interlocked, so we inlay this bronze piece into the door edge with just a little bit of a shadow, so when you close the door, you don't see any bronze. It's another concealed system, so you can weather strip the door, so when the door is closed or the window is closed, you see an old historic door or an old historic window. But when you open it, you see a little rib of bronze, and that rib of the door mates with a rib in the stop. And these two intersect, and you'll actually hear it push air out, and it's metal, metal again. It's very fussy. The doors are fussed, but it's, it's a beautiful system, and it works. And it lasts a long time. So they can get done. And if, even if it's a, a half round, it's got a round top, yep, that can be weather stripped too, even with the metal. Well, like we would on the windows, we'd remove any rotted material. We're not going to leave that in there. And it just kind of depends. It, it can get a bit elaborate. And we, you know, we try to garner as much history as we can from our clients and from the environment and from conditions. You know, it's possible in some scenarios we've treated sash, uh, we've stripped them down or doors, and we've treated them with borate and, and, um, you know, as a preventative me measure, like a um, a mildicide. Um, then we've treated them with a wood hardener to bring more strength back to the wood fiber. And then after the wood hardener and the bore, we've treated them with an epoxy, a two-part slow cure epoxy. So we might do three or four things to bring them back if we think that's necessary. Typically, we would use an epoxy there or a wood repair depending on how much damage we would find. And the wood repair would be an old growth piece of wood we'd use in there. But it wouldn't match. That's the problem. If you're doing a stained piece, be careful. <laughs> it's not from the same tree. It might not be the same species or what have you. And the grain could be running differently. That can be tricky. See, we typically on stain work, we don't use epoxy. Stain, stain work is more expensive for us because it's more hand work. It's more repair by hand, and it's less. It's, we don't repair with an epoxy that's visible. So if we would use an epoxy on a stained piece, it would be an inconspicuous, invisible area. If it's conspicuous, we would do a wood repair. The problem is to match the grain on a stained piece. It's not going to be the same as the grain of that. No matter if the wood's the same species or not, it won't match the grain. So at that juncture, we <laughs> coach our clients to accept darker stains, because darker stains hide more. And it's less like you'll see the repair, and I'll be standing here looking at the door of Elisa and say, oh, that looks great, but if I got close up and looked a foot away, I might see a seam. And then I'd discover. 
thank everybody for, for coming. I thank the city, Frederick, for having us. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.